as other men. He was a man of God. It was the 18th day of December in the year 1928. The day brought news of the first ever train from Amritsa. The mood among the locals of Kadyan was festive. Many of the elders of the town had gone to Amritsa to board the train and experience the historic journey. The commencement of the train service would usher a new era for the movement, as more people could now visit Kadyan. This town was once home to Hazrat Mirza Khulam Ahmad, peace be upon him, who claimed to be the promised Messiah. His son and the second successor of his movement, Hazrat Mirza Bashiruddin Mahmud Ahmad, was now leading his cause. The day also brought further good news for Hazrat Mirza Bashiruddin Mahmud Ahmad and his wife, Hazrat Maryam Siddiqa. It was the birth of their son, Tahir. His mother took every precaution to ensure his good health and upbringing. He grew up as a happy child, ready to play and take any challenge thrown at him. Being the son of the Khalifa, and also the only son of Hazrat Maryam Siddiqa, he occupied a privileged position, but he was never overprotected or spoiled. His mother wanted him to be a doctor or physician, but he was never interested in pursuing such a career. <laughs> As a humble child, I started my life in the ordinary schools of Khadiyan. I was not very, I was never a very brilliant student, but always I was interested in human affairs, in social works, and so on and so forth. So I managed to scrape through in my school education. At the young age of 16, he had to bear a poignant loss. His mother died in 1944 when he was appearing in his matriculation examination. During that uh, period, his mother died. Despite his grief at this difficult time in his life, he continued with his studies. He developed an interest not only in classical Urdu writers, but also Shakespeare, Charles Dickens, Conan Doyle, and other English writers. He started writing poetry. He also developed a deep interest in the study of the Holy Quran, and started to memorize it, but soon realized that he was more interested in the meaning of the words. He took studying the Quran intently. He discovered his father's library and started reading books on Darwin's theory of evolution. Although he never had doubts about Islam or the existence of God, he started investigating the possibility of the existence of God on a logical basis. I have myself researched into this issue because right from my childhood, it has been bothering me in so many ways. And because the religion I believe in is, is a religion of which I am completely convinced. Those parts of which I was not convinced, I have been praying about them and also making my own investigations so that today as I stand, I can say honestly that I believe in everything which I claim I believe in through conviction, not through dogmatism. In his biography, he stated that one afternoon he went through an experience which resolved for him forever the question of the existence of God. The experience, he said, could not be looked upon objectively as a potent proof of the existence of God, but he had no doubt that it was God's answer. I was in a state of semi-consciousness, halfway between a dream and reality. I saw the entire earth squeezed into a ball, there was no creation of any sort visible, no life, no cities, nothing, just the earth. Then I saw each particle of the world tremble and burst out into a slogan, Ah, God! Each particle was proclaiming the reason for its existence. The whole world was flooded with a strange light, and every atom of the earth began to swell and contract in rhythm. I found myself repeating the words, Ah, God! As he returned to full consciousness, he could still see it happening. Although he never had any doubts, this experience affirmed his faith in an unshakable belief in God's existence. The political situation of the subcontinent of India in the 1940s became very fragile. The British monarchy had decided 
that the subcontinent should be divided into two separate nations, one for Hindus and one for Muslims, and be given independence. Muslims and Hindus had lived for years as neighbors, but at the height of the unrest, without rationale, suddenly hated each other. No one was safe. Hazrat Mirza Tahir Ahmad was now a strong young man and part of the Ahmadiyya youth movement, Khudamul Ahmadiyya. He was among many from Khudamul Ahmadiyya who formed into companies and battalions for the defense of Qadian. He was appointed as the officer in charge of one of these units. His task was to organize the defense of the center of Qadian. In August 1947, the community faced an unexpected crisis. The entire area had fallen inside the territory allocated to India. His father, the head of the community, ordered the evacuation of Katyan. At that time, my late father was sent a message by late Mahatma Gandhi, exactly pointing out to him the so-called mistake he was about to commit. My father, then in a sermon, he told Ahmadis in very clear terms, what was in store for them. He said, we are opting for Pakistan, yet I assure you that in Pakistan you will be dealt with so cruelly and you will be deprived of all your rights ultimately that if I tell you now you will shudder and the weak among you may uh, have heart failures. But there is no option because once we accept, we opt out of the Muslim Ummah, for us, physically and uh, politically, it may seem to be an easier, more acceptable cause. But to the message of Ahmadiyyad, that will be a deadly poison. So whatever decision was taken, was taken with full knowledge of what was to happen. Leaving 313 Ahmadis behind to look after the property of the community until they could return, the members of the community migrated. In Pakistan, the community established a new center on a 1,034-acre site near the west bank of the river Chenab. It was called Rabva. All the sons of Hazrat Mirza Bashiruddin Mahmud Ahmad had been dedicated to the service of the community, including Hazrat Mirza Tahir Ahmad. He started working in the youth movement, Hudam al Ahmadiyya, and proved to be a good administrator and an exceptionally hard worker uh, when he uh, became a Khadim, he became a Sayyik and then proceeded through the various responsibilities within the organization of Majlis Khadam Ramdiya, culminating in uh, being a Naib Sadr and ultimately Sadr Majlis Khadam Ramdiya. At that time it was for the whole world and he served in that position uh, for many years. Along with the service to the community, he continued his secular studies at Government College Lahore. The Government College Lahore, a very reputable institution in the north of India, particularly in the Punjab. And there I studied for four years. I went originally for BSc, Bachelor of Science, but ended up by getting an honorary degree, a bachelor's degree. And again I studied in an Ahmadiyya institution and did my doctorate on comparative religion particularly in the study of Islam. By 1954, Rabva was a town of 45,000 people. In the center of the town, gleaming in white brilliance, stood the elegant Mubarak Mosque. In March 1954, a young boy, about 19 years of age, he attacked Hazrat Khalifa al Sani when he finished his leading his Asr prayer in Masjid Mubarak and he uh, stabbed him on his neck and the knife entered the blade entered deep in the body though the wound itself was to heal rapidly it had a serious effect on his nervous system his health deteriorated and he was unable to work his usual long hours some two years later he went to seek advice from specialists in london quite a few members of uh, huzur's uh, family uh, accompanied him. Huzu, among Huzu's children was uh, Hazrat Mirza Munawar Ahmad Sahib, Dr. Mirza Munawar Ahmad Sahib, uh, Mirza Mubarak Ahmad Sahib, then Mirza Tahir Ahmad Sahib. 
After the treatment, Hazrat Khalifatul Masih II decided to return to Rabwa, but he left Hazrat Mirza Tahir Ahmad, now aged 26, behind in London. Although according to the original plans he was due to return with his father, but his father had other plans for him. In London, he lived in Maida Vale and studied at the University of London. Although he had learnt English at school, it was at the London University where he learned how to express himself better in the language. Whilst in London, he also had the opportunity to travel in Europe and meet a range of people. About his experience in London, he states in his biography, At the School of Oriental Studies, I had met people from all over the world, from Africa, from Germany and Poland, from all parts of Europe, really, and from America and Canada and South America. I believe that was important, that God had decided that was what I should do, even though I did not know it at the time. He had decided that I should meet all these people and that I should go out and travel in Europe. I think that was his design. He returned to Rabwa in October 1957 and got married in December that year to Hazrat Sayeda Asifa Begum. That very same year, Hazrat Khalifa Tulmisi II appointed him at the office of Vakfa Jadid, which looked after the needs of Ahmadis living in rural communities in East and West Pakistan. His new post in the Vakfa Jadid put him in direct contact with the small farmers, villagers and shopkeepers, who were one of the great strengths of the community. He was always very caring for the poor and the needy, and this was also apparent in his personal life. موسیقی تو شروع سے اس طرح مطلب یہ تھا کہ ہر چیز میں تم لوگوں نے ان کا حصہ رکھنا